Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin from Follow the Camino and today we're joined in our Camino Talks by Bradley. Bradley Chermside. Bradley is an international best-selling author and uh, the main reason that we've got him in here is because his book, uh, The Only Way is West, is about his journey on the Camino de Santiago. So obviously that's something that's close to our hearts. Um, Bradley has been, until recently, living in Tenerife. Um, and so a uh, little bit of a change recently. He's back on uh, English soil, I believe. Um, but we'll be having a little oh, yeah. chat about the process of writing that book and about his Camino. So thank you so much for joining us, Brad. Well, um, thanks for asking me. It's a real honor to be with you today. Fantastic. So I guess um, the, the question we ask everyone when we first start is, why did you choose to do the Camino? Why not? <laughs> why not? Why not go and walk 500 miles across Spain? Why not go and taste all that amazing food and try out the wine? And why not go and meet people from all over the world? Why not go on an adventure of a lifetime? So um, there were too many reasons not to do it, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, we can trace the origins back to reading The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho and meeting an old friend of mine on the London Underground, just ser um, serendipitously. And uh, he said he'd been looking for me for a while to tell me about this trail he kind of disappeared off the grid when when we um, when we stopped being university roommates, and yeah, he, he, um, he we bumped into each other on the wrong train on the London Underground. I got onto a train, realised it was the wrong train, but oh god, I better jump off, kind of thing. Next thing I know, someone's chased me off that train, and it's my old roommate from university, and we sit down and have a pint in London, and he says, "I wanted to tell you about this trail in Spain called the Camino de Santiago." Long story short, he'd done it, loved it, told me he thought I'd love it, love it too. I started doing my research, so transpired that I needed some changes in my life. And yeah, I couldn't think of a better way to contemplate those changes than walking 500 miles across Spain. And it, um, yeah, just really triggered a whole load of a life changing events, to be honest. Fantastic. That is actually something we hear from so many people who have walked the Camino is that they kind of, they're at a, a funny point in their life and it's just a, a reset, a time to contemplate what's going on, get your head around everything and decide what's next. Exactly. Restore factory settings. That's exactly what it does for you. Tell us how you decided to, to write a book about your experience. It was all kind of by accident, really. Um, I, you know, I'm a musician by trade. So um, until corona, coronavirus come and kicked us all off the stage, um, I was on stage six, seven nights a week. Um, just, that's, you know, just that's all I've ever known, really, pretty much, apart from a um, bit of teaching here and there. But anyway, um, long story short, um, I, I was just writing emails to friends because I decided I was going to go completely off grid on the Camino, no social media, no nothing. I need to clear my head, you know. Um, so I wrote emails. I kept some dictaphone commentaries. Um, and then I came home and I decided to just kind of compile it all. And a lot of my friends were saying to me, oh, we really enjoyed your updates. And people I hadn't heard from in a while that were kind of on my email contact list and said that they'd, they'd, they'd be happy to hear from it. Even they started writing to me as well, saying, oh, that was, you know, please keep them coming. We're really enjoying it. And then I came home and it was just like, all right, well, why don't I try and put something together just for friends and family and the next thing i knew it kind of kind of became actually um i might be might have really enjoyed putting it all together like really really enjoyed it in my spare time and i thought actually i wouldn't mind spending the rest of my life doing this kind of thing and then um the i ended up kind of finding a mentor a book writing mentor hello joe corley author of uh, more ketchup than salsa um, book trilogy about living a life, expat life, living in Spain. He, he's been my mentor, is now a really good friend of mine. And um, yeah, so that's how it all came together, really. So I found a mentor, I found a momentum, I found purpose, I found meaning, I found enjoyment. There's nothing, you know, I get a kick out of, out of words and language and that's kind of how it all snowballed. Amazing. That's very cool. Um, and so, so you wrote the book. 
Um, and what was what was the process like of like once you you wrote the book, you've got a book now, um, and from there it it sort of some time passes and suddenly it is on a bunch of amazing lists saying you know this is topping the charts. <laughs> how how did that happen? Um really uh a lot of help from my mentor um who is also a chart chart topping author and has been for quite a long time but um you i mean in terms of book there's you know you can be a brilliant writer i'm not saying i am i'm just saying you can be a brilliant writer but the problem is if you don't know how to market you need to do your market research you need to do a lot of research so in my spare time when i wasn't writing i was looking up how to actually get the book out there how to get it seen, how to make sure it's um, it's up there um, with the, the, you know, like the, with the, it, whatever you are, I don't want to say competing with, but whoever's in your genre, you need to be there by their side, basically. So I did a lot of work on how to get books on Amazon, basically, and how to be seen. And um, that in itself is, is, is a project on its own. Um, so lots of hours of listening to podcasts, um, lots of research in my own time, lots of chatting to people, lots of networking. Um, and, you know, just like the Camino, you decide you're going to go down a certain path and you end up meeting exactly the people you need when you need them. And it's the same with anything in life. You decide what you want. You make an, in, you make an intentional thought. And all of a sudden, as if by magic, you start meeting those right people and those right things start to happen. Ultrea, move forward with courage. That's what I remember. Fantastic. That's really good. And now you mentioned podcasts in there as well. And that's actually how we came to be speaking today yeah. is because um, we we were listening to, well, we at Follow the Camino were listening to your podcast. Um, and so which came first, the podcast or the book? Oh, the book came first. But, um, you know, when I was walking the Camino, I always thought to myself, I wonder if you could, you know, there's so I see so many forums and forum posts and um, Facebook groups and people are always asking questions. And I thought, and as I'm walking along, I'm thinking to myself, oh, people would want to know about this. People would want to like a silly thing. Like I remember having change in my pocket and thinking, Having change in my pocket is really useful because when you're thirsty and you see a vending machine, you really, really want to um, take that money out and quickly get yourself a drink. You don't want to be digging through your backpack. I thought mm, that would be a useful pilgrim tip if ever I was to write a pilgrim book or do a pilgrim podcast. And I thought, well, actually, I, I, I have all the recording equipment at home. Um, why not start a podcast? Now, now I did have an entertainment podcast, um, which is, you know, the 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 game I'm in, so to speak, which also um, was paying my bills. But um, I just thought, right, well, it just kind of came natural to make a, a Pilgrims podcast as well. So, um, you know, Dan Mullins has got My Camino, the podcast, which is fantastic. And he loves to talk about people's own Caminos and, and delve, delve, delve deep into the reasons why. And, um, you know, he's can go really deep and spiritual. So I thought, well, actually, what I could do is, is something a little bit different and maybe talk only about the practical stuff. So that's why I concentrate on that. And I leave the other stuff to other podcasters. So we're not all doing the same thing, you know? Yeah. And there are, there are so many podcasts out there that not necessarily focus on, on pilgrimages and the Camino, but involve episodes about it because it's such a, such a big time in people's lives that everyone wants to talk about it when they get back. Um, but yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the fact that there are so many helpful tips in your podcast. Um, and it's also, it's quite fun. <laughs> so it's a fun one to listen to. So uh, to all of the people out there, I definitely recommend checking out um, some of those episodes there. There's some really good stuff there. Um, so I guess back to, to the Camino, do you want to talk us through um, which, which route you did, did and, uh, and how you chose that route? Uh, well, the first uh, Camino I, ever done, I, ha I have ever done was the Camino Frances, the, the French way. And um, to be honest with you, it was the only one I knew about at the time. I just thought, right, let's just, that, that's the one I've been told to go and walk. Let's go and walk it. I knew that was the one Paolo Coelho walked in his book, The Pilgrimage. I read that after I read The, the Alchemists. Um, and it was only when I picked up John Briley's guidebooks, I saw all these other Caminos and I thought, oh, would mind doing those as well. Um, so 
I, I've done now walks the French way and the Portuguese way. Um, and they're both amazing journeys, both got their own merits, both got their own pros and cons. Um, and I would recommend them both to, to everybody, to be honest with you. And um, the Camino Portuguese, it kind of, it starts off quite challenging, but you know, it grows on you and grows on you and grows on you. And by the time you've done all of Portugal, you think, oh, that was amazing. And you, mm, I don't think it's going to get much better than this. And then when you get into Galicia and you, you know, it's just green again, I found a lot of Galicia on the Camino Frances was maybe a bit um, dilapidated. Uh, the villages look, you know, they look a bit ruined and, um, you know, the, the houses are crumbling and there's worn out farm vehicles and animals that don't look too pleased to see you, you know, and stuff. And you're kind of like, oh, you know, but when I feel like the, the, the Galician part of the Camino Portuguese is amazing. You know, it's waterfalls. You're walking along little rivers and ravines. Um, it sounds like you've always got a little bubbling brook in earshot. You know, it's just, it's magical. I love it. The worst part is the last part going up. You've got like a, a 10 kilometer walk, just slowly trudging, going up and up and up and up and up and up. So um, that's, that's, that's a, the, probably the hardest part, I think, of the Camino Portugues is the last part into San Diego. It's just like a never ending incline. Um, but yeah, I, lo I love the Camino. I love them all. Love Spain. Love walking, love hiking, um, love writing, love podcasting. It's a labor of love. Fantastic. It's, a, it's interesting that you had mentioned the, the Portuguese route because um, quite a few of the, the people who we work with, um, they'll start off on the, the Camino Frances because that's the one that everyone knows about. Um, and then if they come back and do a second one, which quite a lot of them do, um, they will do the, one of the, the Portuguese routes. Um, mm -hmm. And so many of them say it's it's a different experience because it's just so much more green and lush and it's just a different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very cool that you've done. It's easier done as both. well. It's easier in terms of the terrain. It's, it's you know, um, I think the highest point on the Portuguese Camino is like a third of the highest point on the on the Cru Cruz de Ferro. Um, wow. So on the Camino Frances. So for those looking for something a little bit easier, I think the Camino, Camino Portuguese could be a good way to cut your teeth before you go and go and do, you know, one of the big ones like the Norte or the Frances. But like I said before, whatever you want to do, just go do it. If it's the Camino Frances and you're not a big fan of mountains, you can always start, at, you know, Pamplona or Rances Valles, cut out that big thing on the, on the first day. There's too many reasons to do it and, and, that's why everyone should do it and not worry about the reasons not to. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's that's really good advice, especially about maybe starting on the, the Portuguese, because I think everyone immediately goes Francis, but there's there's so many of the Caminos out there that you can do. Yeah. Uh, speaking true. of, do you have any other plans to do one of the other routes in the future? Of course, of course. Um, well, I was due to go and do the Camino del Norte as for my honeymoon uh, back in July. Um, but there was two things that threw a spanner in those works. And one was the escalating rate of coronavirus in Spain. And also um, I had a terrible knee diagnosis that I've got a torn cartilage and torn meniscus. So it would have been a silly idea to go and do it. So um, I am not lying. My wife and I cried ourselves to sleep the night we got the news because we were so looking forward to it. And I'm not exaggerating. I had never felt, I haven't felt so upset in such a long time. I was more upset about not doing the Camino than I was about actually knowing what was wrong with my knee. Um, so yeah, it was a horrible, horrible moment. But um, then we resolved to go and camp a van in Iceland. And then that got canceled because we knew we'd have to quarantine when we came back to the UK. Um, so it's been a traumatic summer. Um, so what we're thinking is, um, just to, while I'm rehabbing my knee, uh, maybe we're going to go and do the Camino Inglés, which is kind of the six day one mm -hmm. from uh, the north of Galicia to Santiago, obviously. And that'll be a way to get a little bit of training in and just kind of strengthen up, um, strengthen up my, my uh, problematic right knee. Um, so I'm doing everything I can to avoid surgery, basically. So, um, but yeah, th there's always a Camino on the horizon. Always, always. 
definitely seems to be something that people get a little bit of a feeling for. There's um, there's a, another book that uh, we read, I read and then passed on to the rest of the team recently, The Addiction of the Camino, God's Cocaine. Um, oh, wow. Nice. And, uh, and I think that that's a, a very blunt version of, yes, people do get very attached to the Camino. I wouldn't quite go as far as addicted. A controversial um, title. He's very more daring than I am. The author. <laughs> it's, it, it definitely is. It was written God's by Cocaine. A, I like it. I, but it sounds like you've had a pretty interesting year with uh, with a cancelled honeymoon and a cancelled Camino and then a cancelled trip. Um, how how do you think that doing the Camino and uh, and going through that process? Do you think it's helped you to be able to handle changes in life and challenges in life better? This is something we hear from quite a few people. Absolutely, absolutely. But I have to say. Um, um, what life has thrown at me this year, I have never experienced anything like it, like just one thing after another. Um, you know, they say some of the biggest uh, challenges in your life would be losing loved ones, losing your job, getting married. Um, what did that word say? Moving house. I mean, I've had all of that in the last, you know, 12 months. So um, the Camino has definitely sharpened my life skills and give, it definitely gave me resilience and resolve. Let's say that word, let's say that much. Um, and I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible to pos probably get through it if I hadn't have experienced some of the low moments I'd experienced on the Camino, that's for sure. I can, you know, remember some really tough moments on the Camino. But um, I have to say, life has definitely uh, given me a challenge this year. You know, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. So, um, but anyway, I'm still here, still standing, still smiling, because that's the only choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, back in March, you did a podcast about, or a blog about why it's more important than ever to keep your Camino de Santiago dreams alive. Mm -hmm. So it's now October, a few months later, um, and we are all still trying to keep our, our Camino dreams alive. Um, what, what sort of advice can you give to people on still, who are still dreaming about their Camino, who are still wanting to go, but obviously things are a little bit up in the air at the moment? Oh. Good question. I mean, um, with so many travel restrictions, it's, you know, like people from the United States can't come over, for example, and there's such a large contingent, uh, like, uh, contingent of American pilgrims. So I would say just keep those dreams alive by there's so many things we can do. We keep reading those books, keep the Camino in your consciousness keep listening to podcasts, whether it's mine, whether it's Dan Mullins, whether it's Dave Whitson's, watch as many Camino blogs and uh, so vlogs and movies, because the more you watch those kind of things, the bigger that dream comes, the bigger that desire comes. And if you stop watching them and you kind of just think, mm, well, I probably can't go because of the coronavirus, because Travel is going to be expensive because the demand is going to be so high. You know, look, we can always think of reasons not to do things, but though that is a way that it will just keep you looking with the Camino in your vision. And, you know, it's, for many people, it's a bucket list item. And just people like me has changed my life so much. I mean, it sounds a bit trite, doesn't it? Oh, it's, you know, this was, it's life changing. Why is it life changing? It changed my life. I, I ended up moving to Spain. I ended up, you know, wanting to become an author and, um, you know, I ended up writing a book. I'd never written a book before. I never thought I would. Um, so listen to the amazing experiences that people have had on the Camino. And I think that will drive you to do it. It will keep you alive, keep your dreams alive. And believe me, I promise you it is worth waiting for. Even if you have to delay it by six months, by 12 months, it will be worth waiting for. Please don't let COVID-19 ruin your dreams. 
listening to all of the the guests on my um on the podcast I, i'm really really lucky enough to speak to every week um they all come back from the camino talking about the the camaraderie that they they build with their fellow pilgrims that they meet along the way people that they ordinarily wouldn't um they wouldn't mix with may, maybe you know something just something beautiful like I saw, so it said it was a French guy in his 30s, he's walking along and he's kind of strikes up a, a friendship with, a, with an older gentleman in his 70s. And they're both walking together and they make best friends. But would they talk on the street? You know, if they're just walking along the street in Paris, for example, um, probably not. And that's the Camino magic at work. And, and I really remember um, something a French Canadian pilgrim said to me in an episode, Pascal Auger. That's probably a terrible French pronunciation there, but it sounds like I'm watching a low hello, doesn't it? The fallen Madonna. Um, but um, yeah, he said, it is the best gift you'll ever give yourself. So kind of as an extension to your last question, um, I think uh, that's something that's really, really um, always stood out for me. It's the best gift you could ever give yourself. He said, "Not everybody can get to, um, not everybody can get to France from Canada." So he set, he was set up his own pilgrimage route, and his the catchphrase for his or the tagline for his company is, "You deserve a break." So I thought, "That's it. You deserve a break. Go and walk the Camino." And in terms of stories, I mean, I could just say, um, "What's really one story that really stands out for me from my Camino, and it, it's um, it links back to what we said at the start about." If you take a brave step towards what you want, things are just going to fall into place for you to get there. So I was, um, are you ready for story time? Everyone gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around. We're ready to run a campfire, right? We're around a campfire. We're in, um, we're in Finnish there, the end of the world, last night. And we sat around the campfire. And what happened is I'm in Leon. I'm in Leon. And this, this is a story I mentioned in my book. And um, I made a, 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 you know, another unlikely friendship with a Danish guy, Tor. Hello, Tor. Love you, mate. And um, he says, um, we're just getting, we get chatting over a tuna mayonnaise baguette. And he, and, you know, I, I say to him, oh, Tor, I'd really like to walk at night. And he says, well, actually, this, the moon is going to be full tonight. There's no better time to walk during the night than tonight. So I naturally say, would you like to come with me? Because to be honest with you, I was a bit scared to go on my own. And, and he says, yeah, sure. But I need to sleep. I need my sleep first. So he said, wake me up at 3.30 in the morning and we'll go together. Plan. It's a deal. So anyway, I go to bed early, 8 o'clock that night. To be honest with you, that was kind of my normal go to bedtime on the Camino because I was also always so tired. And... Um, he comes and kind of shakes me awake and says, uh, Brad, I'm really sorry, but um, we, we can't walk tonight. And I say, why? He says, um, the doors lock at 10 o'clock. It's the, the noble night silence, you know, because we were staying in, in a monastery. Um, at that point, I decide to just leave, pack up, get out of my gear and just walk. So eight o'clock at night, I decided to go on my own. Um, so I walked into the night in Leon. I walked into the, the Leon night and I got lost. I got lost. You know, the yellow signs are quite hard to find in the, in the, um, for the city signs, you know, the flyer posters, the street signs, the yellow arrows sometimes, you know, they're ubiquitous and all of a sudden they're nowhere. It's like, where the hell am I? So anyway, this was a Thursday night and I'm walking along, you know, last wondering where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. And I'm not boring you, am I? I'm not boring. No, okay, I hope not. <laughs> Sorry if I'm boring you, listeners, but um, um, we did say a story. So anyway, long story short, the, I hear these two kind of English voices over the road and I'm thinking to myself, they sound a bit drunk. So I'm like, the last thing I need is two drunk English people right now. You know, I just don't, you know, I can hear them kind of slurring a little bit and, you know, they're, um, so I thought, right, okay, I'll, I'll keep my distance because this is the last thing I need. Anyway, they crossed the road towards me and um, one of them says, uh, you lost, mate, kind of thing. And I'm like, and in an accent very similar to mine. 
And I'm thinking, wow, this is this is a strange coincidence. So anyway, I, I tell this lovely lady that I'm lost and um, I'm on the Camino. She obviously have seen, she's seen pilgrims walk around and wonder what the hell I'm doing there at that time of night. And she says, um, well, actually I live on the Camino. If you follow me, I'm, I'm going home. So um, I followed her over this railway bridge. She pointed me in the right direction. I was back on track. Um, I ended up running out of steam about 3.30 in the morning. I slept up a church tower and um, I climbed the church tower, slept, not, slept under that. And story time is over, everybody. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, that is, that is a very fortunate coincidence that you were just yeah. wandering around and happened to find someone who spoke English and knew where to go. <laughs> yes, exactly. So keep those dreams alive because those, those puzzle pieces are going to fall into place for you. Fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's, a, that's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess on to, on to more practical matters. Obviously, your podcast has loads and loads and loads of information about the practical side of doing the Camino and, um, and tips and tricks and things that you should remember. Um, do you have sort of a top tips set for people who are sort of right at the beginning of their, their planning and kind of going, OK, I've heard about this Camino. What now? What a good question. You know what? Well, there's one podcast episode, one of the first ones I recorded. So it probably sounds a bit ropey because I was new to it. Um, but um, there's a, actually a podcast episode called um, 10 Top Tips for Walking the Camino de Santiago. Very cheesy, but it was on my mind and I wrote it while I was on the road, actually. So I can't remember off the top of my head all 10 of them. But trying to remember some of them, one thing that really stood out from the podcast episodes that I uh, there was a lovely girl from America, Victoria Sanderson. Hello there, if you're listening. And um, she's got a blog called Writing Restless, which is very entertaining. And she came up with a great tip. So here's tip number one. Um, that is your rucksack. She said, get a U-shaped zip on your rucksack. Now, hmm, curious, why U-shaped zip? Because when you open it, you can see into all of the backpack and not just the top. So you don't have to go rummaging around in it to get something out maybe at the bottom. So that's one top tip. Mm. <laughs> Tricky, that's a good eh? one. I like that Another one. Top tip. Let's say um, when you get to the Alberta what's a really good idea is don't just take the first bed you see. Take a top bunk. Why? Because there's more air up there. Believe me, there's a lot more air on the top bunk. A bit shaky to get down in the middle of the night if you need to go for a wee or something, but. Um, Get a top bunk. There's more air up there. Also, look for a bunk. This is the ideal scenario. Away from the stairs, if there's any stairs. Away from the bathroom, because people go in and out of there at night time. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Away from the stairs away from, and away from the bathroom, if you can. I think there was one other thing I was going to say there, but I think it's left me. Um, let me think of a third tip. Third tip. Now, um, everyone says about worrying about the you know when you're training looking for when you're in your prep and for experienced hikers and walkers you probably don't need to hear this but many people that do the pilgrim uh, pilgrimage for the first time it's the first time they've ever done anything like this you know so don't only watch out for hot spots make sure you break your boots in watch out for hot spots if you get some hot spots put some sports tape over it um i personally don't like compede it rips my skin off um but so sports tape over it luco tape okay luco tape's a good thing and what's the other thing i was going to say i'm always one step ahead of myself here um <laughs> uh, listers luco are one of the things we get a lot of questions about because after you've been walking day after day after day even if you've been training you're very rarely able to train yourself for five days walking in a row and then another five days walking and another five days walking usually it's you know we can get in a Friday night and a Saturday morning and a Sunday afternoon. Um, but yes, definitely breaking in those boots um, and watching out for blisters is very important stuff. Hot spots. And I've, that's one of the mistakes I've made before. I felt a hot spot. I'll be like, nah, nah, I can't be bothered to stop. You're going to keep going. And then, um, you know, you get to the Alberta game and you just see it's like throbbing, you know, it's got a pulse and it's grown eyes and a mouth and, and, uh, and it's been talking you know, it's been, to you for the last 10 talking kilometers to you it's calling its alien friends over and you know it's no and um so definitely stop and put the hot the luco tape also when you're training look out for the hot spots on your 
on your from your backpack. You might get chafing from the straps, something like that. Maybe you've got a few aches or pain somewhere. So don't only don't, you haven't got to just break your backpack in, but you've got to break your clothes in as well. For example, if you decide you're going to wear a vest on a hot day on the Camino and you're used to having a T-shirt and all of a sudden you've just got a bare bit of skin because you've got a vest, that's going to chafe. So these are all silly little things that sound, they sound really minute, but they suck your energy away as you know, as you go on hour after hour and support me. Like, oh. So watch out for those little things that can turn into big things. So not just off the top of my head, those are the three tips, but there is a podcast episode that's 10 top tips. Um, go and listen to that. Just search Fantastic. Pilgrim's podcast on Apple podcasts or wherever and you'll find Great. it. We'll put a, a link to that down below. Um, yeah, on no worries. YouTube Thank you. So people can find that one nice and easily so that they can get the top tips for, for walking the Camino. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, do you have any closing thoughts or messages to leave the listeners with? Right. Okay. So if you want to listen to the podcast, um, just you can go, like I said, onto Apple Podcasts and just type in Camino de Santiago Pilgrims Podcast and you'll see 61 episodes come up. I've managed to keep an episode going every week, apart from the week I got married last year. Okay. So forgive me for that. Um, my book at the moment is on Amazon of uh, Amazon of taking it on and they're promoting it. Um, so um, it's a kind of, you know, it's the lighthearted memoir. Um, so I, I purposely didn't delve into the deeper side of things. because I thought there was a lot of books out there that, that did that. And that's all great and wonderful. But. I wanted to write something a bit more fast paced just because that suits me. That's my personality. Um, and you can only be what you are. Right. So, um, so I, I wrote, um, obviously the book, the only way is West and that's on Amazon at the moment for just 99 P. Okay. It's normally 499 the ebook, but it's, uh, it's just 99 P at the moment. Um, so Amazon have uh, taken control of it. Um, so, uh, it's been a bestseller in humorous essays, travel logs, um, adventure and explorer biographies in five countries, USA, Canada, uh, Australia, um, India, strangely, and um, somewhere else, can't remember. But yeah, it's done well. It's done really well, you know, thankfully. And um, yeah, it's given me the, the motivation to keep writing, basically. So there's a lot more, there's a lot of projects I've got kind of just got to decide which one I'm going to finish because I've got loads kind of half done. At the moment so there is another book on the way but coronavirus and this year have really really thrown a lot of spanners in the works and sometimes it's hard to be creative when you're wondering where you're going to live where you're wondering what job you're going to do because that's obviously you know I, I make a bit of money from from writing from my book at the moment but my full-time income was basically a, a musician and uh, that just when COVID-19 came in so thankfully, you know, um, thankfully I've been able to, to survive, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a tough, tough year, but anyway, it's, um, these things will only uh, make us stronger, won't they? So absolutely. They don't, you don't worry off. about it because you're not here anymore. So it's not, not a problem. <laughs> it's a, it's a slightly morbid happy no well, but what, what, what you can only worry about the things that you, you can worry about right so Definitely. and that's one of my compostelas out there and there's another one up there so um pride just, of place well i just move out of the way there you go. so yeah pride of place in in, in the in the study in the home study wonderful um yeah so i absolutely recommend the only way is west to to anyone who's out there if you haven't already read it it is a very uh fun and uh it's a it's an easy read it'll keep you keep you turning the pages or, or clicking the pages um it's a it's a really good one to pick up if you want just a, a more unique uh perspective on the camino um if you're planning your first camino it might give you some insights into what it's actually like uh, to do the walk or if you've already walked it and you want to hear a little bit of someone else's experience with a little bit of a, a romance theme going through part of it um, and a little bit of mystery at the end what will happen with the mystery person who you're going to meet up with um, I know, if you have a story <laughs> um, 
So thank you so, so much for, for joining us, Brad. Um, I'll absolutely link to the podcast below and to the book as well. So you can go and pick that up off Amazon. Um, and hopefully that will give you some inspiration to keep you all going through what is a little bit of a challenging time for all of us who are desperate to get back to the Camino. So thanks so much, Brad. No, uh, thank have a you. lovely thank day. You, Catherine. It's been a really nice chatting to you and, and thanks for getting in contact. Thanks for promoting my book on your website. Thanks for promoting the, um, the, the podcast on your website. I'm really, really grateful. Uh, you've done that, you know, voluntarily without even contacting me. So no, that's, that's really kind of you. And, and um, it's nice that we're able to help each other and spread the Camino love. Absolutely. Well, we, we love talking about all of the wonderful people who are spreading the message. So it was great to come across your podcast and your book. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much.